On this episode of the Athletic Acuity Sports Podcast, I'm going to be going over some in-season fantasy football moves to make in order to boost your team's probability of winning a championship. I'm recording this on Monday, October 19th. Uh, Later today, we do have an afternoon game with the Bills playing the Chiefs, and then tonight, Cowboys-Cardinals. So I don't know if this video is going to get out before those games are played. Um, It doesn't matter too much, although there are some kind of interesting dynamics within some of the backfields of some of the teams playing later today. So one major point here is that, you know, drafting a fantasy team is only about 60% of the battle, in my opinion. You know, you have to you have to make good in-season moves to be consistently good. Um, And a lot of times, you know, teams with kind of pedestrian drafts that only have a couple of like bright spots in it can still be really good depending on how those teams handle in-season moves. Um, It's really strength of schedule season for me. Um, This is where I really start to dig into which players have easy schedules moving forward and which players are in for, you know, some regression based on their, their strength of schedule. And of course, there's all sorts of, you know, little tidbits of information in every backfield, every receiving corp about who's getting targets, who's getting carries, etc. Um, all of the stats I'm going to bring up in this podcast are going to be based on standard scoring, which to me just means non-PPR. Um, obviously, you know, there's half-point PPR, full PPR. I'm going with no PPR um, for this particular video, but uh, most of the things that I bring up in this video are probably going to be relevant to at least half PPR scoring leagues as well. So starting off with uh, some buy low running backs. My number one guy that I'm targeting, and this is probably the most important guy I'm going to mention on this entire podcast, is Jonathan Taylor. I've already traded for Jonathan Taylor on one team. Um, I'm trying to trade for him on another team as well. It's interesting because going into the year, I had Taylor ranked 28th among running backs in my preseason rankings. I thought that Marlon Mack was going to be someone who kind of was a co-starter for like at least half of the year before they kind of turned it over to Taylor um, with Naheem Hines kind of lurking in the background. I think, you know, based on how the carries were being allocated in week one, I think it's fair to say that Taylor was overdrafted this year by people, but... Because of the Marlon Mack injury, people are getting a lot of positive feedback for having drafted Taylor. Taylor is now someone who I think is being undervalued because he hasn't blown up the way that I think he can moving forward this year. Um, He's currently 19th among running backs in points per game. He's averaging 11.8 in standard scoring, non-PPR. So I wasn't as high on Taylor going into the 2020 draft as most people were. I had him as my fourth ranked running back. But one thing that I do have to admit about him is that, you know, he's a guy who can catch the ball a lot better than what you would think. You know, people think of him as like a downhill tough runner, which is true, but he can catch as well. And the other thing I wanted to bring up about Taylor is that people have been kind of citing his lack of of percentage of snaps as like kind of an issue for him so far this year. He's a rookie and there was a shortened offseason. You know, I think the percentage of snaps he's going to play is going to increase as time goes on. And he's been the leading rusher for the Colts almost every game this year. The Colts have an elite offensive line, I would say one of the four or five best offensive lines in the league. And I want everyone to hear this schedule. So first of all, he's on a bye week right now, which means this is a great time to target him from whoever has him in your in your fantasy league because Players on buys are devalued, you know? If you can convince this guy like, hey, you know, here's a little added goodie, you get to trade this player before he hits his bye week. So you're technically getting, you know, just like a sliver of value in addition to whatever else I'm giving you. After his bye week though, Jonathan Taylor plays Detroit, Baltimore, Tennessee, Green Bay, Tennessee again, Houston, the Raiders, and Houston again. I think those Houston matchups are going to be fantasy gold late in the year. I see Taylor being someone who gradually gets better. Similarly to kind of how he gets better as the game goes along a little bit, I think he's going to get better as the season goes along. And I think he has the potential to have a couple of monster performances against either Tennessee, Houston, Green Bay's defense is terrible as we've seen, the Raiders defense isn't good. I think he's got all sorts of matchups to 
absolutely love if you're a fantasy owner. If you have Jonathan Taylor, I absolutely recommend hanging on to him. I think he could be one of the biggest kind of needle moving players in all of fantasy for the second half of the regular season. He reminds me a lot of Derrick Henry, who I was all in on pounding the table for two years ago in 2018. Henry had the miserable first, you know, nine weeks of the season and then was basically like the RB one or two, I think, for the rest of the year, including that monster game against Jacksonville. And obviously I doubled down on Henry last year and it worked out really well. I think Taylor is in a similar situation as Henry where he's got all the tools and all the potential. So another guy I wanted to talk about is Antonio Gibson of the Washington football team. So before the 2020 NFL draft, Antonio Gibson was actually my my favorite running back in the whole draft. I actually listed him as a slot receiver. Um, I was really high on him. I thought he looked like a really good potential player, just considering that he's basically a receiver playing the position of running back. Um, So anyway, Antonio Gibson is a guy that I had really good priors on, um, and I thought that he was a good pick where the uh, Washington football team found him. Gibson's got a really good schedule moving forward. Um, So far, he is 29th among running backs, averaging 9.2 fantasy points per game in standard scoring. I had him as running back 25 going into the regular season. That was one of my ballsier picks, I think. And uh, I think it's going well, especially, you know, the thing that really won me over with him was that Geis was out of the picture. And Peterson also was, you know, kind of released close to the season starting so that gave me the green light to say okay Gibson's going to be really good Um, I was completely fading the notion that like JD McKissick or something is gonna like take carries away like I mean maybe a little bit but you know ultimately I don't think the you know that Gibson someone this talented for me at least was going to get beaten out by JD McKissick and ironically a lot of people who you know are really into fantasy football actually we're we're talking about McKissick as a real threat which to me is kind of kind of funny actually um so anyway Gibson's got a good schedule moving forward I'm not overly concerned about how bad the offense is there is like a limit to his touchdown probability but you're not paying for like a number one running back I'm just saying Gibson could be a nice little you know additional flex rotational option in your lineup so a third running back that I'm going to talk about with respect to buying low is David Montgomery from the Bears. So Montgomery right now is ranked 26th among running backs, uh, 10.1 points per game right now. In the preseason rankings, I had Montgomery 20th. Um, So I think Montgomery has turned out to be almost exactly what I thought he was going to be. He's basically a guy that you can rotate in as a flex and feel decent about it because he gets workload. I, I don't really think I ever thought of him as like a as like a good RB2. I think he was more of like a high-end RB3, and I think that's exactly what he is right now. He's ranked 26th in points per game, but he has such a big percentage of the share of touches in the Chicago backfield because Cohen is out, and he's got a really good schedule moving down the stretch. So you know, the other thing with Montgomery also is that I liked him coming out of the uh, 2019 draft class. I think he's just a good player. He's not like the fastest guy and he's not overly like impressive with the way he he moves on the field, but he's kind of shifty. I think he's a good receiver and he's got like some good patience and vision. I think he's a pretty good player, even though I think most Bears fans are, you know, kind of down on him for whatever reason. Okay, and a fourth and final running back to buy low on, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. And this one's going to be, you know, tricky because he's playing later today, and I don't know how he's going to do. I think he's going to have a good game today against Buffalo. So Le'Veon Bell gets signed by the Kansas City Chiefs. And I got to say, this Le'Veon Bell thing has hurt me probably more than any other fantasy owner. I was all in on Clyde Edwards-Hilaire going into this year. He was preseason for me, my fifth overall running back, fifth overall player. Um, I absolutely loved everything about this player. The other reason why I was so high on him is because as I mentioned earlier, Antonio Gibson was my favorite running back in the 2020 draft. Clyde Edwards Hilaire was my second favorite one. Okay, and so I was a little bit kind of unorthodox picking Gibson and Edwards Hilaire over kind of the mainstream options, which were DeAndre Swift and Jonathan Taylor. Um, So I really like what I've seen so far from Hilaire. 
as a player, I think he's good. He's been used as a receiver pretty well. He's currently ranked 21st among running backs in points per game at 11 and a half. So there's a little bit of, of regression associated with this number, and I'm really speaking about positive regression. I've been watching a lot of Chiefs games this year just because I have a lot of futures on them. They've been using a lot of other guys in and around the goal line. They've been doing little trick plays to Tyree Kill, Travis Kelsey, etc. Clyde Edwards Hilaire could have, I think, more touchdowns um, if he was being used more in and around the goal line. And I feel like even though he hasn't been great as like a short yardage, you know, kind of like pounding back, he is somebody that I, I still could see getting a positive regression and touchdown value um, going forward here in the regular season. And so now we have the Le'Veon Bell thing, and Le'Veon Bell just signed with Kansas City. So Bell won't be playing this week, which is why I think Edwards Hilaire is going to have a good game. Moving forward, I think Le'Veon Bell is going to take over Daryl Williams' role. I think he's going to be a third down pass catching back. And the reality is that I think Edwards Hilaire going into this week was running back 15 overall. And he was still forfeiting a lot of important third down snaps to Daryl Williams anyway. So I don't really necessarily feel like Edwards Hilaire's value is is plummeting. I think the smart thing to do if you own Edwards Hilaire is to hang on to him. I've seen a lot of people try to trade him for very little. I think that's a big mistake. This is still a backfield that you want shares of. And the other thing is that like, are we like 100% sure that Le'Veon Bell is like better than Edwards Hilaire? Because I actually think Edwards Hilaire could be the better of the two backs. Um, and I definitely think he's the favorite to get the majority of the touches. Um, obviously, we don't want it to be like a Damien Williams, LaShawn McCoy situation like last year. Um, but, you know, overall, I think Edwards Hilaire is still going to be the guy um, for the most part. He's definitely going to have reduced value, but I think this move with Kansas City signing Bell hurts Daryl Williams a little bit more than Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I would at least hold Hilaire if you have him. And I think if you want to include him in like a smaller, you know, as like a smaller part of a bigger trade, I wouldn't mind getting him at this point. You know, he's going to be, this is going to be like probably the lowest his stock is going to be this year, uh, given that he stays healthy. One final note on the Edwards Hilaire Le'Veon Bell thing is that it is hilarious to me, and it would be funnier if I didn't have so much Edwards Hilaire stock on all my teams, but I can't believe how the Jets have literally just done everything possible to make Frank Gore their starting running back. Like, Frank Gore, I think, is 38 years old. The team is 0-6. They suck. They're the worst team in the league, and yet they have done everything possible from, like, cutting Kalen Bellage to releasing Le'Veon Bell. They've done everything possible to make Frank Gore the starting running back. All I'm going to say is I did not think Frank Gore, of all people, was going to impact my season as indirectly as he did. All right, now I'm going to go over some running backs to sell high on. So I'm going to start with Todd Gurley uh, from the Falcons. He's currently ranked 17th in points per game among running backs, averaging about 13 points a game. So I don't hate Gurley. I think he's played better than I thought he would. Um, my biggest problem with Gurley is that he gets injured a lot, and I don't really trust him to stay healthy down the stretch. I think he's been better than I certainly thought he would be going into this year. Um, he has a moderately difficult schedule moving forward, and I just don't like the Jekyll and Hyde nature of the Falcons. You know, I just think there's going to be a couple times later down the stretch this season where, you know, starting Gurley is going to bite you. And in addition to that, again, the injuries, you know, I think there's a definitely a chance that like Brian Hill or whatever, Ito Smith is starting uh, by the end of the season for one reason or another. All right, another guy to sell high on, I think is Melvin Gordon from Denver. So Melvin Gordon was my biggest fade going into the 2020 fantasy season. I, I think the average fan, you know, the average fantasy player was taking him at around running back 16. I had Melvin Gordon rank 32 on my preseason running back list. Um, I think Philip Lindsay is better than him. And I said that before the season. I said that, you know, a couple years ago about Austin Eckler being better than him, and it turned out to be true. I don't think Gordon is that good. And I think the DUI thing is, is a red flag for me. And the other thing that I think, you know, just kind of sucks about his situation is that Denver's offense sucks. I know that they had like a weird win against New England this week, but... 
I don't see it with Drew Locke. I don't know why he's the starter or a starter in the league. Without Cortland Sutton there, I think this offense is awful. I think the limited touchdown probability for Denver running backs is terrible. I wouldn't want either Lindsey or Gordon that badly moving forward, but Lindsey to me is definitely the guy with the more upside because I just think he's the better player at this point. So another running back that I would sell high on is Devontae Freeman. Obviously, I don't have Devontae Freeman on any of my teams. Um, before the season started, I heard from multiple people that there were people in their leagues that actually held Devontae Freeman on their bench when he was still a free agent, which to me was like hilarious because Freeman really isn't that good of a player. And, you know, at the moment here, he's ranked 38th among running backs. He's averaging 7.1 points per game. I don't think he's that involved as a receiver. I don't think he's that good of a runner. Um, he has turned out a little better than I thought he would, but ultimately, I don't want shares of the New York Giants offense. This offense sucks. Like, I don't want a, a running back who's going to get like 50 yards and, you know, rarely score touchdowns. I think that if there are people out there in your league who actually think Freeman is like a viable fantasy player still, just because he has a big name or something, then I would sell him uh, at the moment. and. The other thing about Freeman is that he's been injured a ton in his career. Like, this is why I never liked him. I always liked Tevin Coleman better than him when they were on the Falcons together because Freeman would always miss time. So, yeah, I'm out on Freeman. I think I would sell him if I had him. Um, and then lastly for the, you know, sell high running backs, this one's a tricky one, but Devin Singletary. So Singletary is currently ranked 34th among running backs in points per game. He's averaging 8.4 points per game in standard scoring. So here's the issue, and I know that he plays for a pretty good offense, and Josh Allen's been really good this year, but Singletary has a terrible schedule moving forward. That's kind of the first issue, and then in addition to that, I actually really like TJ Yeldon as a player. I've always been a big fan of him, you know, even back before he was drafted, I think Yeldon was, was a guy that I liked. Um, he's got that, like, upright running stance. He's got probably the best receiving skills of any running back on the Bills. And I've always kind of wondered, like, why aren't they using Yeldon more? Because I've always known he's been stashed on their roster. I think Yeldon's a better running back than Singletary, even though Singletary isn't bad. And the other thing with Singletary here is that, you know, he's had the fumbling issues, but I think he's going to have a good game tonight against Kansas City, or this afternoon. I think he's going to be, you know, better than what his average is this year. I think he'll go over 8.4. Um... But anyway, you know, ultimately, I think he's someone that you could probably sell in a trade. Um, I just think the schedule and kind of like the mystery of Yeldon and whoever else is on the roster is, is something that I would want to stay away from. All right, so I'm going to move to the position of wide receiver. And there are some buy low candidates that I really like. I'm going to start with Marquise Brown. So similar to Jonathan Taylor, Marquise Brown is on a buy right now, which to me kind of makes him more expendable to the fantasy owner. He's also coming off of kind of a disappointing game against the Eagles where the expectations were high. So Marquise Brown is 48th right now among receivers in terms of points per game at 7.3. In my preseason predictions, I had him ranked 26th among receivers. One thing that I've noticed about Marquise Brown is that he's actually a really good player um, at, you know, just kind of running routes downfield. I think he's actually someone who creates separation very easily. And the Ravens offense has become a lot more pass happy this year. They are not using Ingram or Dobbins or Edwards very much as runners. They're still using Lamar as a runner, but the Ravens are dramatically, you know, running the ball dramatically less frequently relative to last season, which is a little bit of a surprise. Marquise Brown is one of the most favorable schedules to end the season. Even though he's on a bye right now, there's a few games I want to kind of circle on the calendar. He plays the Titans week 11. I think that's going to be a, a relatively high scoring game where the Ravens are going to be desperate to win and, you know, Marquise Brown did play well um, in kind of garbage time during the playoff game last year against Tennessee. The Dallas Cowboys played the Baltimore Ravens week 13. This is when I'm circling on my calendar and saying, OK, I'm going to keep Marquise Brown. I'm going to trade like a depth running back or like a depth receiver for Marquise Brown. 
stash him on my roster, wait for other injuries to happen, and then kind of put him in in that week 13 game where it might be like a make or break, you know, game for your fantasy season. It might be, you know, the last regular season game or like it might have to do with like your seeding in the playoffs. I think that's a huge one. And then within the playoffs, he plays Jacksonville week 15. You know, if Henderson's back, I think that, you know, there's a caveat, but if Henderson is gone, I think, you know, playing Jacksonville could be a tremendous game for Marquise Brown. And of course, you know, he's a relatively unpredictable player because, you know, he's a little bit dependent on on deeper passes being completed to him. So, you know, he could go off in some of his other matchups as well. But I think that Dallas game in week 13 is a real impressive one. So yeah, I think Marquise Brown is someone to buy low on. I think he could have a couple of you know, pretty big games down the stretch and you can help your fantasy team out. My next receiver for buying low is Terry McLaurin, who's coming off of, you know, kind of a rough game. And uh, he hasn't been super consistently good in the past, like, you know, three weeks or so, but I still really like McLaurin. I had him as my wide receiver 14 going into the season. He's currently 26th in points per game at 9.2. But he does have a great schedule um, down the stretch here. I think the Kyle Allen being at quarterback thing is a little bit of a concern. You know, Haskins was actually finding McLaurin a lot. You know, maybe it's because they were college teammates, but they seem to have pretty good synergy, even though I thought Haskins was generally like pretty bad. Um, Kyle Allen is also not good, but, you know, McLaurin hasn't really been found as much by him so far. I think ultimately it's not going to be too big of a deal. And part of the reason why is because here's his schedule. He plays Dallas twice. He plays the Giants, the Lions, and the Bengals on his way to the end of the fantasy regular season. So I think those are, you know, pretty important matchups. There's a couple other matchups in there that aren't as favorable for him, but Ultimately, I think McLaurin is someone you buy low on. He's, he's someone that I think is just so talented that he's going to create, you know, opportunities for himself no matter who's at quarterback. And, you know, frankly, it's like, well, you know, Haskins has been at quarterback so far and he's been really good. So Kyle Allen can't be too much worse from Haskins. Okay, and finally, I have Tyler Boyd as a good buy low candidate from Cincinnati. So going into the season, I had Tyler Boyd as my 24th wide receiver. He's currently ranked 34th in points per game, 8.4 points per game so far. He's got a pretty good schedule. And the other thing that I you know, kind of thought about before the year started is that Joe Burrow really likes to hit slot receivers. We saw it a lot in college with Justin Jefferson. Tyler Boyd can do a lot of the similar things that Jefferson did. Um, Maybe not as much of a deep threat, but, you know, Boyd is definitely someone who can carve up the the inside of a defense. And I think he's just going to be a solid rotational wide receiver three uh, for the rest of the year. And uh, I think he's got, you know, some good matchups and he'll be someone that I think rewards more than most receivers down the stretch. Okay, I'm going to transition quickly here to some receivers that I would sell high on. It kind of pains me to say it, but Will Fuller. um, So I had Will Fuller as the wide receiver 33 in my preseason rankings. He's currently 15th among receivers in points per game at 11.6. I'm going to be honest, he's been a lot more consistent than I thought he would be. You know, I always kind of thought Fuller was like the the Jekyll and Hyde receiver um, in the NFL, where it's like you can never trust him enough to really play him, and he kind of goes off in matchups that you don't expect. I'm just thinking the injuries haven't, you know, hit him yet. And I feel like they could at some point. Obviously, I don't want that to happen. But if you're a Will Fuller owner, you have to be pretty excited about what he's given you so far. I think now might be a good time to move him. Um, The Texans don't have, you know, the easiest schedule moving forward. They're not that good of a team. And it's been one of those really like miserable years so far for Houston. If they are if they're a team that finishes like four and twelve, I could see Fuller missing a few games. And uh, you know, even if they do bounce back and win some games, I think he's someone that, you know, I could see missing some time. Um, I don't necessarily like Brandon Cooks either because of his injury history, but um, ultimately I just think you're you're basically selling at the top of the market here with Will Fuller. The other guy I would sell high on if you uh, own him. Mike Evans from Tampa Bay. 
Um, so last year, going into the 2019 season, I was really high on Chris Godwin and Mike Evans because I thought Jameis Winston was going to be a top 10 fantasy quarterback. Um, that all turned out to be all good and true. But I was off of Evans and Godwin going into this year because I knew Brady's average depth of target would be dramatically lower than Jameis Winston's was. And the other thing about Brady is that he just he just likes targeting backs and tight ends a little bit more. Um, he just naturally enjoys doing that more, which is fine. He's been playing well. The issue I have with Evans is that he's ranked 20th right now among receivers in points per game at 10.7. Despite that, he has six touchdowns in six games this year. That touchdown regression is going to hit. He's not going to be scoring as much. And eventually, I think he's going to be just ultimately a really disappointing and, and difficult guy to start week to week. So I think Evans is someone, and you know, I know he's not coming off of a good week this week, so you're not exactly selling at the top of the market with Evans, but I do think that he's still a big name. He's still playing like somewhat well. I would try to try to move him, I think. If you could get like a solid running back for Mike Evans in a season where people seem to need running backs more than ever, I think that would be a, a pretty good move, I think, moving forward for your team. Okay, I'm gonna touch on two other players here to buy low on. I like Dallas Goddard um, quite a bit from Philadelphia here. He's been injured a little bit. He's coming back soon and the Eagles desperately need him. Uh, he was my seventh ranked tight end before the season started, and I actually thought he was going to flirt with uh, being, you know, higher scoring than Zach Ertz this year. Zach Ertz is now going to miss several weeks, apparently, maybe like three to four weeks with an injury. And in addition to that, Zach Ertz has been brutally bad so far. I mean, he's ranked 30th among tight ends in points per game, which is at 4.3. Um, that's brutal. I mean, people, you know, Zach Ertz was one of my biggest fades this year at tight end, but I didn't think it was going to be this bad. I think Goddard could be a really good second half of the fantasy season tight end for a lot of teams. I think if he's a waiver wire guy, you should pick him up. If someone's been storing him on their bench, I think he's a guy that you, you know, try and buy low on at this point. And now one uh, buy low quarterback is Cam Newton from New England. So interestingly enough, you know, when I went over my fantasy football special podcast before the season started. I didn't really mention Cam Newton at all because at that time he wasn't actually named the starter yet. So once he was named the starter officially, I, you know, kind of marked him down as the eighth overall quarterback on my quarterbacks list preseason. And uh, I have him on a bunch of teams now. The COVID issue was, you know, a problem, but now it's behind him. He's playing again. He's currently ranked as the seventh overall quarterback in points per game. Um, he's averaging over 23 points per game. He's got such a high rushing floor, and uh, and that's really the the thing that attracted me to him because I, I'm still someone who thinks Cam Newton's not a very good pocket passer because he's just not. Like, you can watch the game against Denver, watch the game against the Raiders. He's not a good pocket passer, and to compound it with with his inabilities, the Patriots have, like, very few receivers who are good. But... All of this kind of circling together makes me feel like he's going to be a really big rushing threat for them moving on. If you're the Patriots, you're two and three right now. Your only hope really of kind of climbing out of this and being a really good team and what is kind of a good AFC conference this year is to use Cam Newton a ton on the ground. They are going to go full Baltimore Ravens from 2019, I think. And I think Cam Newton could finish as a top five quarterback pretty easily as long as he doesn't get hurt. Um, I think Cam Newton, just because he's coming off of a game where the Patriots offense looked brutal against Denver, people might have kind of a sour opinion on him. I think this is the time to buy Cam Newton if you don't have him already. All right, the very last thing I'll mention for this segment is Austin Eckler and Nick Chubb. All I'm going to say is that if you have a ton of depth at running back and receiver, you know, or just one or the other, I guess, if you could sell off a depth piece for Nick Chubb or Austin Eckler, I think it would make sense. Nick Chubb has a really favorable schedule for whenever he gets back, um, and he might be back right around the last couple weeks of the fantasy regular season and then the fantasy playoffs. So if you're a team that's riding high right now, I think Eckler and Chubb could be guys that you store on your bench um in in kind of like lower trades if there are you know more desperate fantasy owners out there who own Eckler or Chubb 
Okay, next up I wanted to go over some waiver wire ads and drops. Um, there's a lot of guys, I think, to add um, from this waiver wire group. And I'm going to start with uh, Justin Jackson. I don't necessarily think this is like my number one guy to target, but he is probably available um, in, in more leagues than some of the other guys I'm going to mention. So going into the year, I liked Austin Eckler a lot, and I still do like Austin Eckler. It's kind of a shame that he got hurt. Justin Jackson, to me, was like the true handcuff to him. And this guy, Joshua Kelly, I had a really low opinion of him um, going into the 2020 NFL draft. I thought when he was taken in the fourth round, that was about, you know, three rounds too high. For me personally, I don't think Josh Kelly is very good. Let's go over the stats. Joshua Kelly has carried the ball 63 times this year. He has a 3.2 yards per carry, which really just sucks. And if you watch him play, he's a rumbling back who doesn't really offer very much other than just kind of falling forward the way that Leonard Fournette does. He's got eight targets and eight catches this year. Justin Jackson, who's been injured basically the whole way through until this game against New Orleans. 23 carries this year, seven catches on eight targets. He looked dramatically better than Kelly in that game against the Saints. They were using Jackson as the pass catching back. He was taking over the Eckler role in the offense. And Jackson has a 4.8 career yards per carry. I think he's the significantly better back. I don't know if I would drop Josh Kelly. I mean, I don't know. I obviously don't have him on any team because I don't really like him. But if you own him, I think he's he's a permanent bench guy. There's no way you can start him um, at the very at the very best. I would say you know if you're not going to drop him. And Jackson to me is the guy to own. The Chargers do have a very favorable schedule moving forward for running backs. Okay, another guy to add, I think, is Henry Ruggs. I don't know if he's, you know, all that available in leagues, but I've found him on a couple of my leagues um, on the waiver wire. So Henry Ruggs is, he was one of my guys going into the 2020 NFL draft. I had him as my top ranked wide receiver. I also have some appreciation for Ruggs because I had him plus 700 as the first receiver selected in the 2020 NFL draft. And that was one of the only prop bets that I won for the 2020 draft. Um, and it made up for a lot of losses along the way. I really like Ruggs as a player, and I think he's been really good so far in the brief moments that we've seen him. My player comp for Henry Ruggs going into the 2020 draft was Martavis Bryant. He is very fast, can get downfield quickly, a very smooth, upright route runner. He doesn't look like he's trying that hard, but he's moving very quickly downfield. He makes plays on the ball. He scores a lot of touchdowns. He looked awesome in week one against Carolina, made a couple of really nice catches downfield, one on the sideline that was just amazing. Then he got hurt. And then, you know, I think people are looking at him in that Saints game thinking like, oh, he finished with one catch for four yards. I think he was hurt for that game. And I think he got healthier as, you know, the weeks progressed. He missed a couple games. And then against Kansas City last week, he had like, the deep long catch bomb had over 100 yards on just two catches and a very long touchdown. I think people are going to try to paint Henry Ruggs as like Miko Hardman, where like you can't really start him because you don't know when he's going to go off. But if he does go off, he's going to get like all of his fantasy points in one catch. I actually think Henry Ruggs is a lot better than that. I think he's someone that you could eventually rotate in as a starter. Um, I think for right now, I'd feel great about him as a wide receiver four. I think that if you rotate him in as like a flex potentially, that's kind of where he's at. But again, if you're adding him on the waiver wire, you're adding him to your bench, you know, initially. So I think he's worth taking a flyer on if he's available. Another guy to add is Travis Fulgham from Philadelphia. This guy came out of nowhere. I honestly have no idea, you know, where he came from, what his background is, but He's currently second in the NFL among receivers in fantasy points per game at 15.5. He's actually been really good. Um, he's a legitimately good route runner and can make plays on the ball. Um, I think he's worth a dart throw. I, I don't know if this is going to you know, continue. I don't know how sustainable this is, but he's worth a dart throw and the Eagles are decimated at receivers. So um, I, I like Fulgham as like, a, as like a bench guy with some upside. Another guy I've got to mention is Alexander Madison. So... A lot of people are probably really disappointed from Madison this week as the Falcons showed up to play and the Vikings did not. 
Here's the thing with Madison. He's still a premium handcuff. And Dalvin Cook, I've always got like a little beware sign on Dalvin Cook. Whenever you think Dalvin Cook is going to miss like one or two weeks, just be prepared for it to be like six or seven. That's all I'm gonna say. Madison is a guy who I think you would want to store on your bench whether Cook is supposedly healthy or not because he's a three down back as a handcuff, which is very rare to find in the NFL. All right, another guy I'm going to throw out there is J.K. Dobbins. So Dobbins is somebody who I liked um, before the season started. I thought that he would be the guy to eventually take over for Mark Ingram in the Ravens' backfield. Um, on the only team where I drafted Mark Ingram, I also drafted Dobbins. Now, it's been a mess so far, and I can't really start either one of them. But I think that Dobbins has been really promising. He's currently 48th among running backs in points per game at 5.8. But the good news is that he's got a 6.2 yards per carry, and he's got 11 catches on 14 targets. He is by far the best receiving running back on the Ravens. He is much better than Mark Ingram. And Gus Edwards, as much as Gus Edwards is a good, likable, between-the-tackles runner, he doesn't offer anything in the receiving game. Dobbins also averaging 6.2 yards per carry, a little bit skewed based on a couple long runs, but he's looked good. He's looked like the best of the three running backs. He's also a rookie, so he's going to you know take extra time, I think, to get integrated into the offense. I think Dobbins is somebody who I would take a really like late, shot on at this point like if you have a droppable player on your roster I think you know if you're kind of struggling at this point Dobbins is somebody who could come in handy later and I think even if your team is doing well he's someone that I think I still kind of secretly like him uh moving down the stretch this year I know the Ravens haven't been running as much but Ingram just got injured this week Ingram also just isn't very good and uh I just like Dobbins more than Gus Edwards at this point so another guy I've got to mention is Philip Lindsay. This one's pretty simple. I don't think the Broncos offense is any good, but I think Philip Lindsay is better than Melvin Gordon. Philip Lindsay, in each of the past two years, has run for over a thousand yards and has caught exactly 35 passes. I'm sorry, but those numbers are just better than what Melvin Gordon has been doing, especially considering that the offense hasn't been good in either of the past two seasons. So I think Lindsay's better than Gordon. I really wouldn't want either one. But with the whole DUI thing with Gordon, I think Lindsay is probably the better guy to own moving forward. Another name I'm going to throw out there is Boston Scott, just because it looks like Miles Sanders is going to be missing at least a week, maybe two, maybe more. I don't really like Boston Scott that much, but he's someone that did do well in place of Sanders at the end of last season. All right, two more names to get through for adding on the waiver wire. Chase Edmonds, if he's still available in your waiver wire, I think he's someone that's worth a bench spot. First of all, I got to admit, I whiffed on Kenyon Drake. I thought Drake was going to be awesome. I had him as like my running back eight, I think, going into this year. I still had Edmonds as like a premium handcuff, but Edmonds has been better than Kenyon Drake this year. And I, I really never thought I was gonna say that, just considering that I like Kenyon Drake so much. I'm gonna go over some numbers here with Edmonds. He's ranked 36th among running backs in points per game at 8.1. Kenyon Drake is only um, a yard higher in points per game. Kenyon Drake so far has 85 rushing attempts, six targets and six receptions. Chase Edmonds has 19 rushing attempts, 23 targets and 18 receptions. Edmonds is touching the ball like just way less, like far fewer times than Kenyon Drake. And they're separated by a yard per game on average difference. So Edmonds has been the much more efficient back. He's been way better at receiving. They're using him as a receiver more. I would look for that to continue. And I think if you're a Kenyon Drake owner and you don't have Edmonds, it might be a tough road ahead. All right, the final name here is James White. Um, James White, I just plain and simply think is a good player. I really like him as a player. Um, unfortunately, he had to miss, you know, uh, a couple games due to the tragic family situation with him. Um, but I think at this point, New England is pretty desperate to, you know, get yardage, you know, on offense. And James White is their best receiver. Uh, he's been better than Edelman this year. James White playing the role of slot receiver is New England's best chance of picking up a cheap five, six yards on any given down. So 
I like James White, and I think that if he's available for one of your teams, he might be a guy that comes in handy later in the season if bye weeks and injuries show up. All right, I'm going to go over some players that I would drop at this point, and some of these are a little bit controversial. I'm starting out with Mark Ingram. He's ranked 44th among running backs. He's got 6.2 as an average points per game. Baltimore has turned into a committee that is really difficult to deal with. I've already mentioned, I think Dobbins is the guy to own. I'm out on Ingram. He, uh, he offers nothing as a receiver. He's not that good of a runner. I don't really see the value. He's not even used as like a goal line back. Um, I don't really see it with him. I, I think he's droppable. I just don't really ever envision a scenario where I would start him. And in addition to that, he's also injured right now. Next up, I've got Leonard Fournette from Tampa Bay. He is currently the running back 39 uh, in terms of points per game in non-PPR scoring, which he's averaging 6.9 points per game. So look, going into this year, other than Melvin Gordon, I think Leonard Fournette was one of my biggest fades. I've been saying for a long time that Fournette just isn't very good at football. Like, he's not a good receiver out of the backfield. He's just a big, slow running back that kind of trucks forward and picks up the yardage that he's supposed to. He doesn't break many tackles. He just falls forward a lot. So I was a lot less surprised than most people when he got straight up released from the Jaguars. Um, As far as Tampa Bay signing him, you know, Ronald Jones is better than him. And Ronald Jones has pleasantly surprised me a little bit. I think he's definitely the clear number one back at this point in that offense. Fournette's been injured. The injuries could continue with him because of his style of running. I just don't see any value in keeping him. If you're going to keep Leonard Fournette on your team, you're basically, you know, keeping kind of like a relatively bad handcuff on your bench. Like, why not go after someone with a little bit more upside, like a Chase Edmonds or an Alexander Madison, Boston Scott, even someone like Benny Snell, you know, if you're worried about Connor getting injured. I just don't really see the value in keeping Fournette on your team. All right, next up we have Adrian Peterson and Carrion Johnson. I'm going to announce these two together because they both play for the Lions. Going into the regular season, I had Carrion Johnson as running back 47, and I had Peterson as running back 48. I was completely off of these two. I I just want nothing to do with the Lions' backfield, uh, plain and simply. Like, Johnson's been averaging 3.4 points per game. Peterson's actually averaged over 9 fantasy points per game. But DeAndre Swift just looks like the best running back in the backfield. And guess what? Even if he is, I just don't trust, like, this Lions trio of runners. Like, I, I just feel like every week it's going to be a different guy. Could not, you know, care less for this backfield. Another guy to drop is Jordan Howard from Miami. Um, I was wrong about Jordan Howard going into this year. I thought he would be the starting running back for the Dolphins. It's clearly Miles Gaskin at this point, and Gaskin has actually played really well. Jordan Howard has averaged 4.8 fantasy points per game, and that's including getting like goal line looks with like an enormous large, you know, enormously large percentage of his handoffs. Howard basically falls forward similarly to how Fournette does. He's not that good of a player. Um, I thought Miami's coaching staff would like him considering that they were using Kalen Balaj last year, but um, they've, you know, kind of smartened up and started using Miles Gaskin, who's been very good. So Jordan Howard, I think at this point is completely droppable. I honestly think it'd be a shame to have him on your bench at this point. All right, and my next two guys are two guys that I really did not like going into the 2020 NFL draft. Cam Akers and Zach Moss were two of my least favorite running backs selected in the 2020 draft other than A.J. Dillon, who I'm really not even going to mention A.J. Dillon because I thought I I literally was so low on A.J. Dillon relative to where he was drafted in the 2020 draft that I like I was just unbelievably confident that like this would affect Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones zero percent like A.J. Dillon like good luck making the roster basically and by the way you know as far as that draft pick is concerned Green Day's defense being as bad as it is right now is kind of like a function of the Packers screwing around too much in the 2020 NFL draft. But anyway, Akers and Moss, I was very low on both those guys. Akers right now is 75th in running back average points per game with 2.9 points per game. He's the third best running back on his team. That's all I'm going to say. And Zach Moss, same thing, third best running back on his team. He's averaging 6.2 fantasy points per game, which ranks 45th among running backs. He's only touched the ball 20 times. 
He has a 2.8 yards per carry. I think he's a vulture for scoring, you know, touchdowns, getting cheap touchdowns at the very best. That's all I see for Zach Moss. Akers and Moss were both guys that I had as day three selections going into the 2020 NFL Draft. All right, here's the final guy I'll mention for drops, and this one kind of sucks because I was wrong about him. A.J. Green from the Bengals. A.J. Green is ranked 94th among receivers in fantasy points per game. He's averaging 3.6 fantasy points per game, which is absolutely atrocious. I had him as wide receiver 27 going into this year, um, a few spots behind his teammate Tyler Boyd. It's very clear to me now that T. Higgins is the second best receiver in this offense. A.J. Green just looks awful, and he might be done as an NFL receiver. All right, here's the third and final segment of this podcast, going over some recently good performers and wondering, is this performance real or fake moving forward for the fantasy season? So guys that I think you should kind of buy into here. I have to start with Daryl Henderson. So this is a really interesting one for me personally, because in 2019, Daryl Henderson was my second favorite running back in the entire class behind Josh Jacobs. I went into the 2019 fantasy season getting Daryl Henderson on like all my team's benches. Like he was always a guy I was targeting late in draft. I thought he was going to compete with Gurley last year and eventually take over the backfield. Sadly, that turned out to be completely incorrect last year. Malcolm Brown actually beat him out um, as the second string running back last year. But Daryl Henderson has done a 180 and he's been insanely good this year. If you watch him play, he looks like one of the 15 best running backs in the league easily. He's currently ranked 22nd among running backs in fantasy points per game at 11.4. I think he's looked great, and I think the Rams' offensive line, surprisingly, has looked really good. I thought that would be a problem for them going into this year, but they've been fine. The only issues with Henderson is that if you're still scared off by Cam Akers and Malcolm Brown, it's understandable, but... My only counter argument would be look at that game against San Francisco. It was a really big game for the Rams. Obviously they didn't win, but McVay had Henderson out there by far the most of any of those three running backs. And Henderson did a really good job in that game. So I think Henderson actually has kind of solidified his role as the number one running back on this team. And in addition to that, I guess the schedule isn't good moving forward, but I'm actually willing to kind of wave my hand at the schedule just because I think he is the number one back on this team and because the Rams offensive line has been good and the Rams have been running the ball as much as any team in the NFL this year. So overall, Henderson to me is a real player. If you happen to have him on your bench for this year and or you know you picked him up earlier, um, props to you. And I think that Henderson is someone you hang on to Um, unless someone's offering you a ton for him. Another guy to talk about is Chase Claypool from Pittsburgh. So Chase Claypool for me is a real, real player. And uh, I want to go back to my pre-draft evaluation of Chase Claypool. I had Claypool in a tier on his own called wide receiver slash tight end slash H-back. I had him as by far the number one tight end in the class going into 2020 and I had him as the eighth overall receiver. I had a late first round grade on Chase Claypool, and I was really hoping that the New England Patriots would take him because I think that his player comp, and I wanna stress on field player comp, to me was Aaron Hernandez. I saw Chase Claypool as being this really unique chess piece that was too fast for linebackers and too big for safeties. I think he's going to be a really difficult guy to, to defend and that's exactly what he's been so far this year. Pittsburgh's been using him on handoffs, on end arounds, downfield as a receiver. Very H-back slash receiver slash tight end-esque. He's a very unique player. Unfortunately for me, I can only take like half of a victory lap on Chase Claypool because even though I really liked him going into the 2020 draft, I didn't necessarily like him going into the fantasy season. He was outside my top 60 because Well, the Steelers have Juju Smith-Schuster, James Washington, Deontay Johnson, all guys that I at least kind of like, you know, I think are, you know, pretty good players. But to me, Chase Claypool is the best receiver on the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. I mean, make no mistake about it. I like those other guys, but Claypool is definitely the best one. And 
For me, this is kind of the difference between Chase Claypool and a guy like Travis Fulgham. I had no like priors on Fulgham. I never really knew like where he came from or like I didn't watch him previously, but I had really high opinions of Claypool as priors. You know, I had a high opinion on him going into the 2020 draft. So I feel a lot more comfortable saying this isn't some kind of like, you know, three game fluke or whatever. This is going to be a season long type of trend where he's going to be a really good player. Obviously, you're going to expect a little bit of regression because he scored four touchdowns against the Eagles two weeks ago, but right now he's the fifth overall receiver in points per game at 14.3. He's a real player. Make no mistake about it. The next guy on this list is DeAndre Swift. Um, This is the first one that I have listed as fake. I think Swift's big game against Jacksonville was a function of the Jags defense being decimated and horrible to begin with. I already said it earlier in the podcast, but I want nothing to do with the Lions' backfield. DeAndre Swift is currently ranked 25th among running backs in points per game, averaging 10.6 points per game. The tricky thing with Swift is that I actually liked him in the pre-draft process. You know, I already mentioned Antonio Gibson was my favorite running back before the 2020 draft started. Clyde Edwards-Hilaire is my number two. And DeAndre Swift was my third favorite. The issue with Swift, even though I think he's been a tremendous receiver out of the backfield and he's shown a lot of promise, he's been the best running back on his team, but I don't trust his team at all. His team has been incompetent offensively for the most part. I think the Lions backfield is just kind of a a fantasy nightmare at this point. Another guy I wanted to bring up here is Ryan Tannehill from the Tennessee Titans. So the question is, is it real? I think it is. I think Tannehill is a really good quarterback, and this is one that I didn't exactly see coming from a fantasy perspective going into this year. Ryan Tannehill is the sixth overall quarterback for fantasy in points per game, averaging twenty, you know, nearly 23.5 points per game. I think the Tennessee Titans are legitimately one of the five or six best teams in the NFL, and I think Ryan Tannehill is legitimately one of the ten best quarterbacks in the NFL. He's been really good. If you just cut out his Dolphins career and looked at him since the beginning of 2019, Ryan Tannehill has been like the fifth best quarterback in the NFL, like something along those lines. He's, you know, obviously distanced from guys like Mahomes and Wilson, but he is legitimately a good player. And the Titans have a really good ecosystem. You know, I I was all in on A.J. Brown before this season started, and he's been really good when he's been healthy. Corey Davis is a talented second receiver to have. They have Humphreys. They have Johnny Smith, who I really liked. Derrick Henry is a talented running back, and they, you know, for the most part, have a a solid offensive line. I think the Titans are for real as a team, and I think they are a legitimate, like, a legitimately threatening team in the AFC. And I think Tannehill is a legitimately good quarterback. You can start Tannehill as a number one quarterback, I think, in most games moving forward here. The Titans' schedule isn't overly easy, but... I would argue that Tannehill has has kind of passed all the tests so far. You know, he's been really good. And, uh, you know, him being so solid, I think you have to kind of give him the benefit of the doubt at this point. Another guy to go over here is Jamison Crowder. I think Jamison Crowder's production is real. Um, This is a really, you know, kind of a gross pick because he plays for the Jets. But Crowder is a good receiver. And I want to go over this. He's 10th among receivers this year in points per game at 12.6 and this is in standard scoring so non-PPR if you have him in PPR or even a half point PPR he's probably even higher than that he's played in four games this year he has 46 targets in four games 29 catches 383 yards going into the year I had him as my wide receiver 38 and I was actually a little higher on him than the public was and he's been terrific so far. You know, I don't know what it is about the Jets just wanting to sling him targets all game long, but if there's one thing you can rely on with the Jets is that they'll be down in a lot of games this year, and it just seems like whether it's Flacco or Darnold, they're going to try to get Crowder the ball a lot. You know, he might not have the greatest touchdown probabilities, but I would argue that Crowder's targets make him a viable number two receiver for your fantasy team week in, week out. So he's legitimately someone you can start. 
Okay, and finally, we've got Justin Herbert. I think the production for Herbert is real as well. Um, I was completely wrong, you know, going into the 2020 draft. I had Herbert as like a late second round pick, early third round pick um, at the quarterback position. I thought he would have a lot of problems adjusting to the NFL, and I was completely wrong. I just whiffed on this one. I should have liked him a little bit more than I did. Um, and he's been really good so far. I, I would buy low on him now. If he's available in, in leagues, I think he's worth a bench spot. Um, he's currently the QB8 among points per game leaders, averaging 22.5 points per game. I want to read you Justin Herbert's schedule moving forward. He plays the Jaguars, Broncos, Raiders, Dolphins, Jets, Bills, Patriots, Falcons, Raiders, Broncos. That's a pretty good schedule. I think he could be in the top 10 by the end of the year. I think he's he's good enough. He's shown a lot of propensity to push the ball downfield. He's got a little bit of a rushing edge to him. I think he's he's going to be a viable fantasy quarterback for the rest of the season. All right, so that's it for this episode of the Athletic Acuity Sports Podcast, going over some fantasy football in-season moves. Thanks for listening.